Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, we are excited to, to have you here with us. If you're watching online or from our Parker campus, we're glad to have you as well. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open up to the book of Malachi chapter 3. And you're like, Malachi, where is that? Page 952. If you don't have a Bible, it's, it's there in the seat in front of you. If you're watching in Parker, you can grab one in the table in the back. And uh, if you have your own Bible or are using the Bible app, it is the last book in the Old Testament. So if you find one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John just work backwards until you find what looks to be an Italian prophet named Malachi, and it's actually Malachi. Um, that joke worked on student ministry. I'm glad it still works on adults. That's all I got. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the book of Malachi, and uh, Malachi is, is a prophet. He's the last prophet in the New Testament as we are transitioning to the New Testament, but but prophets, their job was to bring a message from God and deliver it to the people. And typically prophets, they had a message of correction or rebuke because God's people typically wandered away from God's instruction. We wouldn't know anything about that at all. But, uh, you know, their job was to say, hey, you guys are missing the mark. Let's kind of get back to center, back to what God has called you to do. And oftentimes their job was to kind of redefine how people should be living. And the, the idea of definitions matter because we define so many different things. We define words. The words that I share today, we have common definitions for them which allows us to understand what's going on here today, right? We have entire books and websites devoted to defining words. We also define terms. If you ever look at a legal document, they're defining the terms of that agreement so there's a shared understanding of what that is. And if it's a real good legal document, there's actually definitions for the definitions and sometimes it's a little excessive. But we also hopefully define expectations. When we say, hey, this is what I expect from you or from this situation, and we define those things. We often uh, define things at work, too. We use titles and roles to define where we fit in. And even within an organization, we use job descriptions and position descriptions to define what people do. We also define relationships, right? We, we use terms to define how we interact with each other, what role we each play in our lives. And uh, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, when my wife and I were first dating as teenagers, and uh, I was totally new at this. I hadn't dated anyone before, and so I'm just totally green on this whole experience. And about a week into dating, our friends kind of were asking us individually, they're like, so you guys boyfriend and girlfriend? And my guy's friends are asking me that, and I'm like, she's, they're like, is she your girlfriend? I was like, well, she said yes to a second and third date, so I think so. And they're like, well, no, you gotta like, you gotta define the relationship. You have to ask her to be your girlfriend. I'm like, that's stupid. What? <laughs> like, there's a second ask that I have to do, and so the like, it, this tension keeps building, and everyone keeps asking, and it keeps getting more and more just like awkward. And so I just blurt out one night, I'm like, you're my girlfriend, right? <laughs> and she looks at me like, uh, yeah. Like we both kind of had this, uh, I guess we have to define that, and we moved on. And here we are married, you know, 15, 14 or so years later. Everything's great. But I learned in that moment, like you have to define things. Things have to be defined if they're going to be proper. And, and beyond that, we have to be very clear on where we base and where we get our definitions. See, for those of us that are, are followers of Christ, a lot of our frustration over the last several years in our culture has been our culture redefining things with a different basis of definitions than we use. As we look around, there's so many different categories of things, and I could make this a, a message just railing on those different definitions, um, but we don't have a week or two to do that. So what we have to do is just recognize our world is beginning to redefine things with a different standard. And if we're followers of Christ, we use God's word as a standard for those definitions. Because we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God which teaches us what to believe and how to live. So the basis is, or the Bible is the basis for how we define everything in life. And, and so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some financial definitions. We're in a series called Entrusted, uh, and we're looking through how do we kind of adopt God's financial plan. And some of you have legitimately been asking me the last several weeks, hey Robert, when are you gonna give a mon another money sermon? 
Apparently I'm the money guy. So for those of you that have been asking, here we are, you're welcome. Um, but we're in this series called Entrusted and we're talking about this and, and I, I wanna remind us, Chad mentioned this last week, but, but as we go through this, here's the reality for the sermon series. We've said that, that if you're a, a follower of Jesus, the Bible is the basis for how we understand life. And as we go through this series, we're gonna base all of this fully on the Bible, which means that this message series and, and this message tonight as well is designed for those that are followers of Jesus. And if you're not in that place of trusting Jesus as your savior, then tonight is gonna be much more informative than it is instructive because your next step isn't necessarily to apply what you hear today, but to respond to the call of Jesus to come and follow him. But for those of us that are in that place of following Jesus, this is a time where we get to redefine some things. Uh, and so let's look at the passage, Malachi chapter three, starting in verse eight, we're going to, to look at this, and it says this. It says, will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So what's going on here? So, so Malachi is addressing these people, and what he's doing is he's helping them redefine some things financially, but also what he's doing is he's kind of addressing some of their current struggles, their, their societal and economic struggles, and connecting them to, to really the people's indifference towards tithing. And, and so what he's gonna do is he's gonna give some redefinitions that I think actually apply to us here today as well. So I got four things that if we wanna adopt God's financial plan, these are four things we need to redefine according to scripture. And the first thing we need to do is we need to redefine ownership. Because as, as Malachi is sharing here, there's some tension because he's saying, hey, you're robbing God. And, and there's some tension to the audience. They're like, how, how are we robbing God? In the same way, if you know, Pastor Pete came out here to do announcements a moment ago and said, hey guys, uh, just a little announcement for you. All of you are stealing from God. Uh, we got winter camps coming up. We got some other things. And you're like, wait, what? But, but Malachi isn't off base here. He didn't mishear God's message. He didn't miswrite this down. But the idea here is that we're robbing from God. Because as we define theft, we understand theft as when we take something that rightfully belongs to someone else. And the idea is that, that all the money we have is God's and we, by not giving to him in a tithe, are stealing from God. Malachi wasn't saying, hey, you guys broke into the temple and like ransacked the place. I saw that guy over there carrying a, you know, a pillowcase full of gold, candle stands out, and this over here. He's saying, no, you guys aren't tithing and so you're stealing from God. And, and this is really built on the, the understanding that Chad set up so well last week. So if you weren't here last week, please go back and listen to the message. You can watch it on, on the website, you can go on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, you can listen to it there. But Chad really set this up well when he, when he explained, hey, when you look at the Bible, God created everything. Everything in our world was created by God. And scripture repeatedly says that God owns everything. And so the stuff that we have isn't actually ours, it's God's that he's given to us. And scripture uses the word steward, or we could say manager, that he's made us managers of the things he's given us. And so the implication there is that the, the money we have in our bank account, the investments we have, the, the possessions that we have in our life are actually God's that he's given to us to manage on his behalf. And part of that management expectation is to give a portion back to him. So as we, as we redefine ownership, it's not saying, well, I guess I have to give some of my money to God. That's not what tithing's about. Tithing's about saying, hey, God, you gave me 100% of this, and I'm gonna give a portion back to you. And, and, and that has to be the place where we start our, our understanding of this, this basis of what a tithe is. But, but as we step into that, we also have to, to dig in a little further because we have to redefine what obedience is. Because as you look at this passage, he's, he's saying, hey, 
you're robbing from God, but then in verse 10, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. He's saying the, the full tithe, that, that there's this idea that they probably were giving to God, but less than a tithe. So for us to, to say, okay, what was going on with them, and what's the implication for us? What is a tithe? And how we define that matters, because usually we use it as a verb. We tithe. It's a, it's a verb. It's an action we take. That's usually how we use the verb, or the, the word, rather, is a verb. And it's us giving to God via the church, and it's, it's not really something specific in terms of money. But when you look at Scripture, the tithe is actually a very specific monetary amount. So let's go back here and, and look at the history. So the, the history of this really starts Genesis chapter 14. Moses uh, meets Melchizedek, which becomes the first high priest, and some of you are like, Mel what? It's okay, just stick with me. But anyways, Moses for the first time gives financially to a high priest, and he gives 10%. As we fast forward through the story a little bit, Genesis 28 records Jacob praying to God and saying, hey God, uh, if you will be with me and help me provide safety for me in this upcoming situation, I'll give you 10% of what I have. And as we continue to, to work through the, the story of the Old Testament, we get to the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus in which God really sets up some formal instructions and some formal laws for how the people should operate. And in that, part of his requirements were for his people to give a tithe. And the word tithe shows up for the first time, and it literally meant a tenth. A tenth of someone's income or increase. And the idea was that this was something that people would give as a recognition that, hey God, all of this came from you, and I'm gonna give you 10% back as a way for me to trust that you're gonna continue to give me what I need. It's an act of obedience and submission and trust to God. And so coming back to this, passages as Malachi is talking, the idea here is that when he says the full tithe, the, the reality that they were dealing with was that these people were giving less than 10%, but feeling like they had been obedient. They had kind of, whatever percentage point or, or obedience point they were at, they were saying, hey, I'm doing my part because I'm, I'm, I'm doing a tithe, but Malachi's like, no, you're not. That's why he's saying a full tithe. Because anything less than 10%, he's saying, isn't obedient to God. Now, I have to stop here because I feel like some of you are like, that feels really legalistic. Because on the surface, it does. It, it seems like God's up there like looking at our pay stub, like with his little calculator with the printout sheet and like just going to town and he's looking at our like online giving statement or, like they forgot to carry the one. Lightning bolt. <laughs> like that's... That's not how this works. Because it, while it looks legalistic, the reality is that God's not up there in anger if we're like, hey, I'm at like 5%, but, but next month I'm gonna up that so we can maybe get to like 6%, and I'm kind of working towards that. Because with God, it's almost never about perfection, it's about progress. But the issue that, that is being addressed here is the people that have moved the goalpost and said, well, God defines it this way, but I'm gonna define it this way. The people that have said, well, I just give some, and that's, that's being obedient. That's the people that Malachi is addressing and saying, no, you can't claim obedience when you're falling under where God has defined obedience. And here's, what, here's how I've heard this in, in, in my life in ministry. I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't give a tithe of money, but I give a tithe of time. And, and I just volunteer and I, I give my time to the church and that's how I tithe. Uh, okay, or I hear people say, oh, well, you know, I don't give a tithe, but, but I've got this talent and here's how I, I help the church this way and I supply this need that way. And both of those things are great. Because scripture says that we should give our, our time and our abilities to help the body of Christ be more complete and full in what they can do, but that's not a tithe. A tithe is fully based on our income and our, and our finances, not with what we do on, on a, a Friday afternoon with our volunteer hours. And so we have to be very careful that we don't move the goalpost of obedience 
And maybe you're not at that point of 10%. God's not upset about that unless you're saying, well, I'm doing my part, I'm checking that box of obedience when you're actually underneath where he has called you to be, which is what Malachi is addressing here. So as we look at this though, we can step back and realize this issue of moving the goalposts is actually much less of a, a finance issue and much more of a life issue. Because it's so easy for us to, to look at following God and being obedient to him and say, well, you know, God just cares about you know, how I do with the spiritual stuff of going to church and reading my Bible and praying and, and making sure that like, my morality is decent and I'm good with that. And we kind of sandbox our obedience to God and we kind of put it over in this little corner and say, well, I'm, I'm checking all the boxes because I'm going to church and I, I'm doing my version plan and I'm doing this. But God wants our obedience in our work, our family, our sexuality, and how we make decisions and how we talk about people and how we serve and how we forgive people that hurt us and in how we spend and manage our money. And he wants us to, to actually use his word as the standard, as the guide for that, and not just move around the goalposts so that we can feel good about ourselves and say, hey, I'm, I'm checking the boxes here. So let me encourage you to, to ask yourself, how are, how are you doing at, at following God's standard of obedience? And how are you doing it also, not just avoiding the bad stuff, but doing the good stuff that he's called you to? See, the people in Malachi, they weren't getting condemned and kind of uh, criticized here because they were doing something bad. It's that they were failing to do the good that they knew they should do. And the book of James in the New Testament talks about this. It says, if you know the good that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that's sin. So we can't just look at our finances and go, oh, well, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not stealing money from people or cheating on my taxes or returning things I shouldn't on Amazon or doing these things, so I'm good. But, but are you doing the good things that God has called you to? Because that's part of our obedience to his plan for our life. And if we want to follow God's financial plan and his life plan for that matter, we have to not redefine what obedience is based on our desires, but based on his word. So we have to, we have to define our, our, the ownership and redefine the obedience, but finally, as we look at this, we get the opportunity to redefine learning. Because in this passage, we get this, this statement that is kind of perplexing at first, because many of us have picked up throughout the, the time of our being in church or following God that, that we're not supposed to test God. How many of you have ever heard that before? Like you shouldn't test God. Okay, well, like a good chunk of you, those of you that are listening are, are, are raising your hands. I appreciate that. So <laughs> we get this because at some level this is true. And we find it in scripture as well that as we understand like how we learn about God and how we experience him, we're not supposed to test God. Because in Deuteronomy 6:16 6, it says, you shall not test the Lord your God. And Jesus actually quotes that back to Satan when he's being tempted in the wilderness. And in, uh, let's see here, Isaiah 7:12, Isaiah says that he's not going to test the Lord. Again, that, that, that idea that it's not good. And uh, Exodus 17:7 7 and Psalm 106:14 both say that the Israelites were suffering because they were testing the Lord. But then, did you guys pick that up? Halfway through verse 10, God says, and thereby put me to the test. Now, you don't have to have a seminary degree to go, hmm, something's amiss here. And that's because there's, there's two different types of, of testing and how we learn and experience about God because for most of us, our process of testing God looks like this. It looks like us stepping as close as we can to the line of sin and rebellion and seeing what we can get away with. It, it's us being that spiritual toddler pushing the boundaries of our heavenly parents saying, what can I get away with? It, it's us being you know, the, the spiritual teenagers pushing the curfew to see how late we can go without getting in trouble. And in that definition, testing God is an absolutely terrible idea 
because it's us trying to go away from God's plan to see what we can get away with without the consequences. But the alternative here, that we get to kind of put a little spin on this, is God says, test me by being completely obedient to my instruction and see how much blessing you will receive as a result. And the context here is finances. He's saying, hey, completely trust my plan and outline for tithing and financial obedience and see the blessings that you'll receive. But we can do the same thing with our marriages. We can be completely obedient to God's design for our marriage and see how he will bless our life. We can be completely obedient to God in our parenting, in our work, in our relationships, in our speech, and see how God will bless our life. Because this idea of testing isn't seeing how close we can get to the boundaries without consequences, it's seeing how close we can get to obedience to see the blessings. And this is, this is a cool test because let me just read it just to make sure we understand. He says, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. How many of you think that sounds like a cool test? Like, I don't know what the windows of heaven look like, but them overflowing into my life sounds like a real good idea. But we also, in this though, have to redefine what blessings are. Because far too many of us read that and go, cool, God's like the original multi-level marketing guy. He's like the Amway or Mary Kay or doTERRA person. If I give him a dollar, I get five or 10. This is great, let's go. But that's, that's not what he's saying here. God's not illiterate or or dumb. He didn't mean to say money here and mess up and see blessings instead. If he said, hey, if you give a tithe, I will pour so much money into your life that, that you will have no more need. If he meant that, he would have written that. And again, Pastor Chad last week set this up so well. He said that, that we often can control the amount of blessings we receive, but not the type of blessings. See, if we, if we fully pour ourselves into God's plan for our life and our money, if we fully trust him at this point of tithing, we can experience an increasing amount of blessing in our life, but we can't control the type. Because maybe it is that, that we need more money in our life, but we probably don't. Maybe it is that, that when God looks at our life, he says, hey, the blessings you need are the fruit of the Spirit. You need more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe God looks at our life and says, hey, you need more blessings in your relationships, in your marriage, in your health, in your mental health or your stress levels. And maybe those are the blessings that we need when we step into obedience with God. Or maybe it's just the blessing of more peace in our financial situation. I I asked a friend if I could kind of anonymously share his story because he was was talking with me uh, late last week and it just seemed so fitting for this because uh, back this spring, he kind of pulled me aside and he said, hey, Robert, I, I wanna share this with you. I, I began tithing. And he's not new to church, but kind of like all of us is on a spiritual journey. I said, okay, well, well tell me about that. And he says, well, you know, I've been in church for a long time and I've given some here and there. He said, but I finally committed to every paycheck giving an actual tithe, giving 10% of my, my check. And he'd only been doing it for a few weeks. And so I just encouraged him and said, hey man, great job, way to be obedient, keep it up. And last week he was chatting with me and he just, he's like, hey, remember, remember that conversation we had a few months ago about tithing? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, I just feel the need to share. He says, this past season has been so amazing. He said, money's always been a tension point, a struggle, a stressor. And for the last six or eight months, we've had so much peace. It has been so uh, uh, so, you know, peaceful and, and comfortable. Now, some of you are like, oh, well, it's because he's gotten a new job or this. I know his situation. He's been in the same job. His wife has been in the same job. He wasn't the person here in Lake Havasu that won the lottery last week. <laughs> and he, by definition, he's been living on 10% less than he was previously. 
And so if anything, money should have been more of a stressor. But he's saying, it's been so amazing. And he said, I, I so trust in God's plan because of the peace that I've experienced over the last few months. See, that's the, that's the financial plan that God has for us. So what about you? Will you redefine your financial plan and adopt God's financial plan? Will you say, hey God, I will step into that place of obedience and follow the plan that you've laid out for me? And, you, and, and let me encourage you to take this challenge from Malachi here and commit to tithing and see what God does in your life. You might be thinking, really, right now? You realize like Christmas is like 40 some days away and they got Thanksgiving, we got that trip we gotta pay for and we got meals to buy and we got this and there's so many presents we have to get and then we got the plane tickets and this. Yeah. And, and if that's a stress for you, maybe now is actually the perfect time to say, hey God, I'm stressed because I don't feel like I can do this but I know you can. So I'm gonna step into obedience and submission and trust you. Or maybe you're like, you know what, I've been there, done that, not really my thing, not interested, tithe doesn't work for me. And I've had this conversation a few times, and usually the conversation goes like this. They're like, well, you know, I tried tithing and didn't really see, you know, any difference, and it just didn't work out. And I always go, okay, well, well how long did you do that for? And they go, three or four, and in my head I'm thinking, years, months, and they go, three or four paychecks, had a short-term view of things, and I asked, well, if your kids start doing the dishes every night, but they do it for two nights, do you expect that to be a long-term thing? And they go, no, they probably just want something out of it. <laughs> go, okay, what correlation do you see here? <laughs> we have to have a, a long-term commitment on this and not say, hey God, how quick can I get the results I'm looking for? Or I've also had the conversation, oh, I've been there, done that, I tried tithing, and..." You know, at the end of it, I still didn't have a better job and I still, you know, didn't have as much money as I wanted. And I said, well, that's because you're defining the blessings wrong. But let me encourage you to take this challenge from Malachi from a proper perspective and say, hey, God, I'm gonna commit to tithing. And I'm gonna encourage you guys to commit six to nine months. Sometime next summer, you say, hey, between now and next summer, I'm gonna tithe. I can actually tithe 10% of my income and as you do that, take a snapshot. Where are you at right now? Not just with your finances, but with your life, with your marriage, with your, your spiritual walk with God and, and your stress levels and, and all of those things. And take another snapshot next summer and say, hey, how were things different? How has God poured out from heaven the blessings for me in those areas? Because I've never talked to someone who is for a long-term tithe and gone, you know what? I just wish I could get a refund, it wasn't worth it. It's never happened. So, so let me encourage you today to, to consider taking this challenge because scripture says that, that God is our perfect heavenly father who knows how to give us good gifts and he wants to bless us and give us good gifts. But maybe the thing keeping him from blessing us the way we want is our lack of obedience. And maybe it's at this point of finances, maybe it's another point, that's between you and God. But let me encourage you to step into a place of obedience for God's plan to, to, to define obedience by his standards and see how God blesses your life. Because scripture abundantly says that he will work in our life when we follow his plan. So it's our hope for you today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that, that you are a good God. God, first, that you're a God of grace because none of us are perfect with this. None of us can look at our life and see a, a path of perfection in our financial obedience to you. So God, I, I thank you that there's grace, that, that you're not about perfection but about progress. But God, I ask that you help us to see the places where we've moved to the goalposts, where we've defined obedience the way we want to instead of the way your word does. And God, help us to trust you. Especially as we approach the holidays, God, f finances are such a, a major point of stress for so many. God, help us to trust you. 
the, the one that owns all things, the one that has created all things, the one that has given all things to us, help us to trust that the things we need are gonna be provided for by you and help us to, to, to walk in obedience to your plan in that. God, we love you. Help us to love you and follow your plan better. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.